Hi there, welcome to the Commodore 64 compilation comparison video and in this video I'm going to be looking at the compilation called Mindbenders and this one's a little bit different from the normal compilations I look at because if you look closely in the corner here it says not for retail sale and the reason for that was that this was an exclusive bundled with the Commodore 64 system back in 1990. It was put together by Domark Software in conjunction with Commodore and it consists of four games. This is one I see quite often in bundles on eBay and I imagine most people look at it and think it doesn't look particularly good but I thought it'd be interesting to check it out so let's do that. Let's begin by taking a look at the packaging for this one then and it's pretty big it's hard to actually fit it in the frame of the camera but as you can see it's quite nicely presented considering that it would have just been inside the box of a Commodore 64 bundle. You've got the Mindbenders logo and the Commodore branding above that as well. It says games to puzzle and intrigue and then we've got a picture which I think this is that famous statue the thinker uh, playing Trivial Pursuit on the Commodore 64 which is a bit random and as you can see the four games included are Trivial Pursuit, Split Personalities, Snare and Confusion. Uh, sides of the box have got the Domark logo on and the Mindbenders logo. I think it's the same all the way around. So let's move on to the back, which again is pretty nice considering this would have just been inside a box with a Commodore 64. You can see lots of information about the four games. There's screenshots, there's pictures of the original box art. Very nicely done. So no complaints so far. Let's take a look inside. Inside the box there are four cassettes, one for each game, so there's no cheaping out by putting one game on one side of a cassette and another one on the other. Uh, no packaging to sort of keep those in place, but all the same it's good to have a cassette for each game. Uh, and here's the instruction manual, which is very hefty indeed, very thick, it's in multiple languages and uh, there's lots of information for each game, so it begins with Trivial Pursuit. I won't go through this in too much detail, I can't even flip a page over at the moment. There you go, so you've got all the information about Trivial Pursuit. And then later in the uh, manual, there you go, here's Confusion, for example. Again, multiple pages of instructions in each language uh, for each of the games. So that's pretty good as well. So there you go, that's the packaging for the game. Or, should I say, games. The packaging for the compilation, even. Let's move on now and take a look at the four games. Since this compilation was only included in a Commodore 64 bundle, there's obviously no standalone adverts for it, but I did find this advert from Commodore that appeared in a lot of computer magazines in the run-up to Christmas 1990, and that does feature the bundle that includes Mindbenders, along with information about the Amiga 500, the brand new Amiga 1500, and the Commodore 64 game system, the ill-fated cartridge-only machine that initially retailed at under £100, and was designed to compete with 8-bit consoles such as the NES and Master System, though of course it failed miserably. Anyway, the section about the C64 pack says, On the subject of fun and games, we present a totally new double pack for the C64, undoubtedly the world's favourite games computer. If brain-stretching tasks are your forte, choose Mindbenders with confusion, split personality and trivial pursuits, it says there. Or if it's pure escapism you prefer, there's Night Moves with a compelling Midnight Resistance, Night Breed, Secret Agency Sly Spy and Shadow Warriors. There's definitely a few mistitled games in this advert. It says the C64 computer comes with a data cassette and two joysticks and is outstanding value at $159.99. So notable things to pick out there is that it doesn't say that Snare is part of the Mindbenders compilation, though presumably that's just an oversight. And the other thing is, of course, is that the bundle also includes a more action-based compilation in Night Moves, which was produced by Ocean Software. And by sheer coincidence, I actually picked that up in an eBay bundle quite recently, so at some point in the future I'll review that compilation too. That's all I could find in terms of advertising for this compilation, so let's get on and look at the four games, and the first and most recognisable of those is Trivial Pursuit, which was originally released by Domark in 1986. The computer game version of Trivial Pursuit is a faithful reproduction of the original board game, but with many enhancements and features that make it more fun to play, so the instructions say anyway. I imagine you already know how to play this game, but just in case you don't, up to six players can take part and the winner is the player who first returns to the central hub on the game board and correctly answers a question in the category chosen by the other players. Starting from the central hub, players throw the dart to choose a random number, which replaces the use of dice. They then move the token to whichever spaces are highlighted on the board. When the token lands on a square, the player is then asked a trivia question in the category that relates to the colour of the space they've landed on. The categories are Art and Literature, Science, Geography, History, Sport and Leisure or Entertainment. If the player answers their question correctly then their turn continues, but if the answer is wrong then the turn moves to the next player. When a player is at a category headquarters at the end of the spoke and answers their question correctly, they're given the appropriately coloured scoring wedge which is entered into the playing token. If the player lands on one of the grey throw again spaces then a further throw is given without having to answer a question. Once a player has their token full of six wedges, they then make their way towards the central hub, but must land exactly on it. Once there, the other players choose the category of the question to be asked, and to win, this question must be answered correctly. 
Let's get the major negative point about this game out of the way first. It's a multiplayer only game, as you have to tell the computer whether you've got the answer to each question right or not, so it really doesn't work as a single player game. For the purposes of this video footage, I played as me versus evil me. I responded honestly to each question I got, whereas evil me got every other question right, regardless of whether I knew the answer or not, effectively simulating a basic AI opponent. Now onto the positives, and there are plenty of them. The game has excellent presentation, with a good options screen that gives the ability to load in other question packs, see player stats during the game and change several settings. The in-game graphics are good, with a decent representation of the board and the player markers, and a fun way to digitally roll the dice, with the mascot character TP throwing darts at the numbers. The animation on TP is nicely done, and there's lots of neat detail in the question rooms, with them being different for each category. Sound effects are quite minimal, but there are plenty of simple but recognisable tunes for the music questions, and a few jingles here and there too. Control of the game is easy, using the joystick to select the majority of options, though it can sometimes be a little twitchy when choosing a square on the board to move to. As for the gameplay, well, it is a faithful recreation of the board game, which is just as challenging so it can take a long time to complete. To that end, TP can be switched off if you want to speed the game up, as doing so switches the dice roll to be a random flashing number and removes the animation of TP in the question rooms. The one big improvement this has over the board game is that in addition to the standard text-based questions, you also get picture and audio ones, which mix things up and keep it a little more engaging. The bank of questions seems to be pretty large, and just like in the tabletop game, many of them are very difficult, though I did have a couple of favourable runs of questions during my playthrough, including two about Star Wars and a few other pretty easy entertainment-based ones. It was also quite fun to see some questions that have dated badly, predicting future events at the time that never actually happened. Ultimately, this is a really good digital alternative to the board game as long as you have multiple players, and that's where the problem lies playing it now, as I doubt many people could convince their family to gather around a TV screen to play an almost 40 year old computer game these days. It would need multiple choice answers and AI opponents to be any good as a single player game, and that does sadly make it quite redundant, though it still has some value for testing your own knowledge I suppose. Next up we have Split Personalities, which is another game originally released by Domark in 1986. In this puzzle game you must create a picture of a famous face of the era by arranging the tiles on the play area in the correct order. The spinning cursor is controlled with the joystick, and at the start of the game you'll find it in the top left hand corner under the arrow. You can make pieces of the picture or bonus items appear by pressing fire while the cursor is in this box. The picture on the right hand side of the screen lights up to show the correct position for the piece that the cursor is currently selected. To move a piece or item, place the cursor over it, hold down fire and press in the direction you wish to move it. You can only push a piece until it either hits the wall or another square, and you must watch out for the black cracks in the border and also the doors that open and close automatically. If they're closed they act like the normal wall of the play area, but if they're open then the moving piece will disappear through the gap. If it's a piece of the picture then this is put to the end of the queue of pieces waiting to be brought onto the playing area. If it's a bonus item then it disappears forever. Each level has several items associated with the person whose picture you're trying to create. If these are pushed together then they'll give you bonus points, but if you push the wrong items together they'll both be destroyed with no bonus being given. Most of the items are relatively harmless, but the bomb explodes after 5 seconds, so you must destroy it by pushing it away through one of the doors. At the start of the game you have 3 lives, but if a bomb explodes or your time runs out then you'll lose one. If you complete a level then you'll be awarded bonus points based on the time remaining, before moving on to a new picture. The graphics in this game very much look like they originated on the Spectrum, but some colour has been added to the tiles that you have to arrange and the famous faces they display are well drawn and easily recognisable. Sound wise it's pretty basic in game, though there are a few jingles and a pretty good SID tune on the title screen. In essence the gameplay is a glorified version of one of those sliding block puzzles you had when you were a kid, but it does have enough bells and whistles to make it stand out a little. The joystick control was a little twitchy so it might be better to play it with keys, though I didn't bother trying that myself. There are two possible strategies to the game, you can either work with the blocks you have as they come out, or alternatively just throw away most blocks until you need them and build the picture from the bottom layer up. I've not worked out which is actually the best, but the latter might be the better approach for speed. The bonus tiles that come out periodically add the chance for upping your score and are amusingly thought out for each personality, such as the red button and nuclear explosion for Ronald Reagan. The time limit and bombs add urgency into the mix, which makes the game quite panic inducing for what could have been a casual puzzler otherwise. 
The time limit is pretty tight, making speed of completing the puzzle important, but if you lose a life from running out of time then you can get more points for finishing the stage after it resets if you are close to completing the puzzle. That's only a viable strategy if you're able to earn extra lives though, and you don't get one until you reach 100,000 points. The biggest problem with the game is that the bombs are often really unfair. 5 seconds is not enough time to get rid of them if you don't have two blocks in the top right corner of the playfield to allow you to push the bomb through the door at the top. If a bomb comes out right at the start of a level then you'll lose a life and be on the back foot immediately, so this does feel like a bit of a bug that affects the enjoyment of the game. As I said earlier, the game does have some interesting features and the satirical humour is quite fun if you lived through the time these people were famous. In the end, it is just a sliding block puzzle game though, so I'm not sure how much longevity it would have had even back then. The third game in the compilation is Snare, and this was originally published by Thalamus in 1989, just a year before this compilation was released, so that makes it the newest of the four games and it's also the most action focused. The backstory for the game says that in 2049, Andre Thelman, one of the world's three richest men, died. During the last ten years of his life he had a maze built into a temporal cavity in the gardens of his home. This maze, called the Snare, is formed of twenty independent areas floating in a void, linked by concealed teleports and guarded by robots. The surfaces of these areas are covered with pressure sensitive tiles of various types with different environmental effects. Rumour has it that before he died, Thelman entered the snare one last time, taking with him one of his most valued possessions to leave hidden there. Many have wondered what that item might be, but no one knows as everyone who has entered the snare since has never returned. The snare was developed into a giant arena, with every attempt to conquer it globally televised. Each competitor enters the maze in a hover ship armed with a plasma cannon and teleports into Area 1, with only minimal information to go on. You take on the role of the next competitor. Your ship hovers over the scrolling floor, but is destroyed if it falls down the gaps. All turns are made instantaneously, snapping the screen 90 degrees around the ship. Your ship's able to fire bullets, jump over gaps, and also leave a solid trail behind it, which has some uses. Your objective on each level is to find the final teleport, two linked flashing circles. Each area incorporates a number of puzzles, including various types of tiles found on the floor, local teleports, switches and the robot guardians. Periodically tiles transform into energy vents for a short time. Energy can be collected from these by flying over them, and if carried out of an area it will create a bonus which includes points, extra lives and more. On losing a ship, the area you're currently in will reset itself to the beginning, and if you have any craft left then a new one is teleported to the start. As you'd expect from a Thalamus release, the presentation of this game is very polished. There's an excellent title screen with a great Martin Walker SID tune and an arcade style track mode that gives plenty of information about your ship. The in-game graphics are really good, especially the ships and explosions which use a high res overlay to give them more definition. The surface tiles that make up the playfield are varied and colourful, with each one having its own characteristics such as speeding up your ship or causing it to change direction. For that reason, this is probably not a good game for anyone who's colourblind. There's no music once you play in the game, which is a shame, and the sound effects are unremarkable, though some sounded very similar to those used in Cyberdyne Warrior, which I looked at as part of the 4th Dimension compilation about 6 months ago. Before you start each stage, lots of info is given about what to expect, which is another plus point for the presentation, but not much of it is actually that relevant, at least to begin with. Movement of your ship takes a lot of getting used to, as the screen flipping 90 degrees when you change direction is extremely disconcerting to begin with, and can lead to a lot of mistakes early on. Mitigating this somewhat is the fact that the controls are very responsive, so once you get to grips with the screen flips then it is possible to be very precise. Jumping is quite unintuitive though, as you have to press fire and push down on the joystick, which is easy to forget in the heat of the moment. Even when you get used to the controls however, you'll still need precise timing and reactions to make any progress, as this is a very hard game even from just the second level, and by the time you get to stage 4 it's near impossible due to the enemies that home in on you and your inability to stop. Your ship also fires very slowly and after a couple of levels, enemy ships need two or more shots to destroy them, so that adds even more difficulty. You also have the option of drawing the trail behind you, which acts as a wall to the enemies, but you can also crash into it, so I didn't get much value from it. I assume it becomes more important later on though. The bonuses are a nice addition to the game and give you a good chance to rack up a bigger score or get extra lives quite easily if you can find them. They spawn regularly on each level, but don't stick around for long, so you have to keep your eyes peeled. 
You do get lots of status info on both sides of the screen whilst playing, but it's hard to read due to the size and colour scheme, and the scanner in the top left corner is pretty useless as it doesn't point out where the exit is. What makes the game so difficult is having to jump over gaps and manoeuvre through tight spaces without hitting walls. As soon as you pick up any speed, you need lightning fast reactions and it's easy to panic and make a mistake, leading to a lost life and a reset of the level. The game is essentially a memory test as the levels don't change, combined with that need for quick reactions. After many attempts I finally managed to complete level 4 and my copy of the game wouldn't load in the next set of levels so I gave up at that point. Assuming it actually works, the multi-load isn't too off-putting though as I believe you get to restart from the last loaded set of levels once you've reached them. Snare looks great and is an interesting idea but it's definitely too hard right from the start which is quite typical for a Thalamus game. If it had introduced the many hazards in a gentler way to stop it getting frustrating so quickly it would have been much better for it. I'm just taking a quick moment to say thanks to all my channel members, whose names you can see on screen now in my supporters hall of fame. If you're enjoying this video and would like to support my channel then why not become a member yourself? For a monthly fee starting from just 99 pence, you can get access to special membership perks such as your name in the supporters hall of fame on every video, early access to most of my content, member only polls and even choosing games for me to play in future videos. If you're interested then please click on the join button below this video for more information. Alternatively, if you're not able to commit to a monthly contribution but would still like to support my efforts then you could give a super thanks. This one-off donation gives you a highlighted comment on whichever video you choose to click the button on and anyone doing this will also get a shout out from me on a subsequent video. Again, you can find the super thanks button below this video. You can also help raise the profile of this channel by liking this video and leaving a comment which helps improve my ranking in the mysterious YouTube algorithm. Any support you can give, financial or otherwise, is greatly appreciated. The final game on this compilation, and arguably the biggest mind bender of them all, is Confusion, which was originally released in 1985 by Incentive Software. The backstory for this game places you in a huge 64 story automated industrial plant that is used for the production and storage of deadly confusion bombs. This place is considered to be one of the greatest threats to mankind. Having gained access to the computer control room, your mission is to explode every bomb on all of the factory's 64 levels. The levels are broken up into 8 sections, each with 8 floors, and you have authorised access to the first level in each of the first 6 sections. The assembly lines consist of sliding pallets which are used for the movement of components. The pallets are left covered in sections of fuse wire. You can move pallets into the adjacent space using the up, down, left and right controls, and must lay a fuse from the spark to the bombs. The spark will then burn along the fuse and blow up the bombs. All the bombs should be destroyed before the timer fuse burns out, and you can watch for this at the top of the screen. You also get warning signs when the timer is low, and running into dead ends, solid blocks or off the edge of a pallet will reduce the time limit. In certain areas, the factory sprinkler system releases water droplets, which will extinguish the spark if they collide with it. You begin with 5 sparks, and will be awarded a bonus spark after every 4th level. This is the second game on this compilation that takes heavy influence from those sliding block puzzle games, this time mixed with a Pipe Mania style game, although to be fair, this predates that concept by several years. The game is aptly named and is certainly the most bewildering of all the titles in this collection. Much like Snare, it's very hard right from the start and seems almost impossible after the first few levels. The fuse moves really quickly which doesn't give you much time to think about rearranging the maze, and the fact you're limited to moving tiles into the one empty space doesn't help. I often found progress was more through luck than skill, though I guess the more you play the more you'll get to grips with it. The graphics and sound are very simple, but the movement of the tiles and other objects is smooth and the controls are responsive. There's also a great Rob Hubbard tune on the title screen, and a host of options including selecting your starting level, and a demo mode which helps explain how to play much better than the instructions do. It's also good to have the option to continue from the last level you completed when you inevitably lose all your lives, though one accidental move of the joystick does eliminate that possibility. Like most puzzle games, I did initially find this interesting and quite addictive, but ultimately got frustrated due to the high difficulty and challenging time limits. I'm not sure I'd ever be able to complete some of the stages, and once my patience with it ran out, I didn't think I'd ever want to bother trying again. Oh. <sighs> 
Those are the four games that made up Mindbenders then, and I'd say Domark put together a good quality compilation of more cerebral games here for Commodore to bundle with their machine, with all of them being polished and well programmed. The one issue they all have though is that they are pretty difficult, so given this would have been some people's first taste of playing computer games, it would have been a tough introduction to the C64 for many. Time to move on to rating this one then, and as always I'll begin with individual scores for the games it contains. Trivial Pursuit is an excellent adaptation of the famous board game, with slick presentation and plenty of options. At the time it was released, this would have deserved 9 out of 10 as a cheaper alternative to the board game, with the added attraction of music and picture questions, which would also have avoided messing about with all those little plastic triangles. However, the fact it's multiplayer only and now has some questions that have aged badly means it is somewhat redundant now, so I'm going to give it a score of 7 out of 10. Split Personalities gives the classic sliding block picture puzzle game an arcade edge, along with some satirical touches. Sadly, those arcade style elements are the very thing that cause frustration with the game, especially the bombs that can kill you off unfairly. I'm going to give this one a score of 6. Snare is a typically polished Thalamus game that also has the company's trademark difficulty level. The blend of shooting and the need for quick reactions certainly taxes the grey matter, but the control issues and very high difficulty right from the start can be off-putting. Nevertheless, I was quite impressed with this one, so I'm scoring it 7 out of 10. And finally, Confusion is another twist on the sliding tile puzzle, and even more difficult than Snare after a few levels. Plus points are the presentation, options and music, but the game seems impossible on many stages, so your enjoyment of it is going to depend on your level of perseverance. Mine ran out quite quickly, and for that reason I'm going to score it 6 out of 10. I'll now move on to rating the compilation as a whole, and as always I'll start with the packaging. Considering this is only ever meant to be bundled with the Commodore 64, the packaging is nice. The front cover image isn't very appealing, but the back of the box features descriptions and multiple screenshots of all four games. Each game is supplied on its own cassette, and there's a hefty instruction manual too, with the only downside to that being no page numbers or contents page, so it is hard to wade through. Overall though, it is very well put together, and I'm going to score it 8 out of 10. The average score for the four games comes out at 6.5, and as for value for money, well, as this was never released at retail, it's hard to give this rating, but if it had been, you can assume it would have cost something in the region of 10 to 15 pounds. If we valued the games at roughly three pounds each, then I think all of them offer enough to be worth that. The difficulty level on all of them could be off-putting, and may impact their longevity though, but having said that, this would have been a very cheap way to get Trivial Pursuit compared to buying the board game. All that adds up to a value for money score of 7, and that means the overall compilation rating for Mindbenders comes out at 69%. This is the point where I'd usually look at any old magazine reviews of the compilation, but since this one was never released on its own, obviously there aren't any. However, I did find a sort of review of the Commodore 64 bundle that includes Mindbenders. The December 1990 issue of New Computer Express came with this free supplement called the Christmas Gamers Guide, and in that is a rundown of all the home computer bundles available that year. The introduction to this feature says there are so many computers to choose from, all claiming to be the best, that picking up a Christmas bargain can be a nightmare. To aid your decision, we present the No-Nonsense Express Guide to the Games Machines on offer, helped by local schoolboy Chris Jones. And on the following few pages you can see roundups of all the systems available at the time, including two Atari ST packs, a Spectrum Plus 2 bundle, the Sam Coupe, and in the bottom right hand corner of this second page, the Commodore 64 bundle. The magazine did make a mistake here though, because they think there are two separate bundles, one for Night Moves and one for Mindbenders, whereas the bundle actually included both packs. There's a reasonably detailed overview of the system, but what I'm really interested in is what it says about the games, and in the final couple of paragraphs it repeats the mistake that it's available in two different bundles that year, and then goes on to say Mindbenders consists of strategy and puzzle games, presumably designed to appeal to parents who disapprove of their offspring killing things all the time. More permissive parents can choose the Night Moves pack, although of course actually you get both packs in the same bundle. It rounds up this review by saying the C64 is well worth considering if you want a reliable, versatile computer but the budget is tight. What's more interesting though is schoolboy Chris Jones's comment. He says the games on this one are surprisingly good considering it's such an ancient machine. The sound's none too hot but the graphics are okay and the games are really cheap. That comment maligning the sound on the C64 really just proves the point that kids are quite often really dumb. The scandal doesn't stop there though, because on the roundup of all the systems later in the supplement, New Computer Express have awarded Best 8-Bit to the Amstrad CPC 464 Plus, which at that point cost £330. It did come with a colour monitor, but only one game, which was burning rubber on cartridge. Madness. Time to round off this episode then, in the way I always do, which is to see where Mindbenders has placed in my compilation league table, and as you can see, for the full price compilation rankings, it's gone in at 5th place with its 69%, and I think that's pretty fair, it's a solid enough compilation, but not good enough to trouble the top 4. 
When looking at the combined compilation rankings that bring in the budget compilations, there's no difference because there's been no budget compilation so far that's ranked higher than 65%. That brings this episode of the Commodore 64 compilation comparison to an end, and what did you think about this compilation? Would you have been playing this in 1990 if you'd received it with your brand new Commodore 64? Or would you have been playing the more action-packed night moves instead? If you've got any thoughts about any of the four games or the compilation as a whole, then let me know in the comments. And if you enjoyed this video, then I'd appreciate you giving it a thumbs up. If you'd like to offer further support to my channel, then why not click the join button below this video to find out more information about how you can become a member, with no obligation to sign up. I'll be back with another Commodore 64 compilation review next month, and plenty of other retro gaming content in the meantime, so thanks very much for watching this video, and until the next time, see ya!